Well, welcome everybody to the uh, 2021 John Cobb Common Good Award Ceremony. Um, I'm Bruce Hansen with uh, co-host Mejun Fan, welcoming you on behalf of the Institute for Postmodern Development in China, the Cobb Institute, the Center for Process Studies, the Institute for Ecological Civilization, and the Budapest Center for Long-Term Sustainable Development. This is the final event of a 14th International Forum on Ecological Civilization. This engaging six day event has drawn practitioners, participants and presenters from around the world through online technology. It was a remarkable innovation for this, um, for this year, which we've never had it online before. It's, um, but it's allowed for great conversations around the world. So uh, good morning to those of you in China and Korea. Um, good evening to those of you in the United States. And uh, I understand it's about 3.30 a.m. in Budapest. So that's, that's a little bit early. Um, today we're presenting the 2021 John Cobb uh, Common Good Award to Professor Kun Jian Yu in recognition of his remarkable contributions to the construction of ecological civilization. Um, we have a wonderful hour ahead of us, uh, starting with the Chinese dance and song performance, followed by a um, song with, from Pilgrim Place, where Dr. Cobb resides. Then our keynote speech will be from Dr. Jay McDaniel, followed by the presentation of the award by Dr. Uh, Philip Clayton and Reverend Tom Sung. We will then have a few words from Professor uh, Kung Jin Yu and um, Dr. John Cobb and closing with some music from Arkansas where Dr. McDaniel lives. May, do you have any other comments that you think before we get started? Uh, yes, I will introduce in Chinese. Maybe we have some new friends. They don't um, they don't know much about the John Cobb Common Award uh, mm. history. For this award, it's for the famous postmodern thinker ecological economist, process philosopher, Professor John Cobb Sr. He is working for his whole life for the community's common welfare. And he is the, this award is the highest award in ecology ecological civilization. And during our Claremont Eco Forum, we have the common award ceremony. And we have already presented 10 awards to the excellent people who got this award. And I just presented more information for the previous uh, winners of this award. If you have time, you can read for more. And this award, we hold the ceremony every year in Claremont. Sometime we do it in the uh, university, but most time we have the ceremony in the Pilgrim Place in Claremont. And I sincerely welcome, welcome our friends from Pilgrim to join our ceremony online. It's our first experience. Glad to see everyone. Thank you. Can someone hear?
Is it time for the video? Yes, please. Dear Dr. Ka, dear friends Chinese, and knowing Chinese with great love, we will sing this song, Jasmine Flower, for all of you. You are welcome to join us to sing together. Thank you. <laughs> The performance was from the what, what had a kindergarten in Beijing. And the next performance is for from Harbin, what had Peifeng kindergarten. Yeah, uh, uh, Beijing White Hat Kindergarten is a government uh, nation owned kindergarten. 
there are 400 kids for Harbin. What had kindergarten is a private kindergarten. There's about 20 kids. I, I don't have a second video. Do you? You, do, you don't have a second video? No. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Okay. Then, um, uh, let me do that. Okay. We don't have the second video. Let me see. Oh, I'm sorry for this. performance from Pilgrim Place, the musician. And our and third performance is from Pilgrim Place. Jian, uh, Jian managed, uh, uh, managed. So he is a member of uh, 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 Picker. Uh, 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 我们每年的这个ceremony都会就是表演他的这首歌曲。每次呢,怎么说,我们这是第一次通过线上的表演这样做。Every ceremony we play this song, but this is the first time we play online. Tuvalu mote atua. Tuvalu, Tuvalu, tiny island in the ocean blue. Tuvalu, Tuvalu, you live or die by what we do. Blue lagoon and coral sand mark the beauty of your land. But ice is melting far away, the sea is rising in the bay. Tuvalu, Tuvalu, tiny islands in the ocean blue. Tuvalu, Tuvalu, you live or die by what we do. Cyclones blowing to your grief, coral dying on the reef. Fish no longer come in swarms as the ocean water warms. Some still fight with tanks and guns, but a new war has begun. This is how the world attacks with car exhaust and chimney stacks. Tuvalu, Tuvalu, Tiny island in the ocean blue Tuvalu, Tuvalu You live or die by what we do Hear the island people say 
Join us in more gentle ways. Treat all life with precious worth. Live more simply on the earth. Atolls flood as rising seas. Swamp your homes and breadfruit trees. Time to leave, you cannot stay. Where to go, you cannot say. Tuvalu, Tuvalu, tiny islands in the ocean blue. Tuvalu, Tuvalu, you live or die by what we do. Tuvalu, Tuvalu, tiny islands in the ocean blue. Tuvalu, Tuvalu, you live or die by what we do. Thank you, Andrew. And now I'd like to, um, it's my honor to introduce uh, Dr. Jay McDaniel as our keynote speaker. Um, mm. Dr. McDaniel is a member of the board of the Cobb Institute and editor of Open Horizons, a website specializing in offerings for the public on process, philosophy, and theology. Um, a volunteer musician at Senior Citizen Centers in Arkansas, where he lives, working especially with those suffering from Alzheimer's. And an emeritus professor of philosophy and world religions from Hendricks College in Conway, Arkansas. Deeply interested in East-West dialogue and in ecological civilization, and inspired by the work of Drs. Jihe Wang, Meijun Fan, she has been, he has been to China 13 times over the past 10 years, offering workshops on constructive postmodern thinking and practice. His aim, like that of all who are at the ceremony, is to create a world that is more compassionate, sustainable, and joyful with no one left behind. Dr. McDaniel. Great. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity to, to speak to you. Uh, I'm really honored uh, to be able to do this, and I'm especially honored uh, to know about our guest, whose work I've been studying, Professor Kong Jian Yu. So for the past two weeks or so, I've been listening to his lectures on YouTube and reading as much as I could of his work, and uh, I had two impressions. And the first was, uh, his thinking is so similar to that of John Cobb, to that of Jiha Wang and Meijun Fan, to process philosophy, to constructive postmodernism. He felt like a, a brother in his way of thinking. My second impression was, where have I been? He has so much to offer. And he says some things that process philosophers and theologians sometimes forget to say, don't say. For example, we in the world of constructive postmodernism, we like to talk about big ideas coming down to earth. Well, Professor Yu deepens that question by asking how can big ideas come down to infrastructure? How can they come down to uh, the roads on which we drive, of uh, the parks in which we live? Now, admittedly, we do some of that thinking. Um, but we have so much to learn from you, Professor Yu, and I know you're gonna tell us more about it um, in a bit. So I'll just try to get us started. I have a little PowerPoint for you, uh, for us. It's called Flourishing Communities, Humane and Ecological. Appreciating the work of Professor Kong Jian Yu. Next slide, please, Andrew. But before we get to Professor Yu, let's all give a big word of thanks to our leader, our teacher, our mentor, John Cobb. Um, I couldn't decide what photo to use of Dr. Cobb, and there he is, but I think this quote is illustrative. He says, the sustainable alternative is one in which smaller and smaller regions produce more and more of the goods they need closer to where they are consumed. These economies will contribute little to the greenhouse effect and will survive the exhaustion of oil. That's only part of John Cobb's thought, but it's an important part to us tonight. 
So here we are at the John Cobb Common Good Award Ceremony. And we might ask, well, what is the common good and who is it good for? Well, for those of you who are native English speakers, you know that phrase common good, but perhaps if you're not a native speaker, you might wonder what is it? Well, basically it is something that is good, desirable, healthy, beautiful, satisfying. But the real question is who is it good for? Who gets to be satisfied? Uh, a modern view, which Professor Yu crit critiques, and which John Cobb likewise critiques, is the idea that, well, the common good is good for people, and maybe even more specifically, for urban elites, understood primarily as individuals seeking their own personal satisfaction. That's one way to think of, to answer the question, who is it good for? But the constructive postmodern or process view is different. It's that the common good is good for people, animals, and the earth as they live independently, have their own lives, and also as they live in community with one another. So the common good is, is good for, for all of us, not just the elite, and actually not just the people, good for the earth as well. Next slide, please. So I said that we in the process world are interested in the question, how do big ideas come down to earth? So we have a name for this common good. We call it ecological civilization. We borrow it from China, of course. It's the idea that at this stage in history, for the sake of survival, people can and should live, live with respect and care for the community of life. I highlight survival because that's a word that Professor Yu highlights as well as John Cobb. Ecological civilization is not sim simply a desirable option, it's actually a necessary option if we want to survive uh, as people on the planet. Now, if you put that in Chinese terms, you might say ecological civilization is creative harmony with one another and in harmony with the earth. But as John Cobb emphasizes, we gotta get practical. So a big idea like this comes down to earth in local communities, in rural and urban settings that are creative and compassionate, participatory, good for animals and good for the earth with no one left behind. And with infrastructures, physical, intellectual, social and spiritual that help make compassionate communities possible. Professor Yu is an expert on ecological infrastructure. Next slide, please. So here he is. And this is an ecosiv builder to be sure. Uh, he was born to a peasant family in Dongyu village in Southeast China's Zhejiang province located where the White Sand Creek and the Wujiang River meet. He lived there till he was 17. He rode on a water buffalo, among other things. And then due to good fortune and hard work um, and changes in China, he went to Peking University and then on to Harvard. And today he's the founder and dean of the Graduate School of Landscape Architecture at Beijing University founder of the design group of, of Turinscape in Beijing, which has over 600 employees, chief architect for more than 200 projects in urban settings in and beyond China. He's an international member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and he is one of the most influential ecological architect, architects in the world today. He's one of a handful that really have a marked influence around the world. Next slide, please. So I'd like to, to share a quotation with you from Professor Yu uh, and talk about some of the lessons we learned just from this passage. He writes, I swam in the creek during the summer and caught big fish. This was when he was growing up, when the monsoon season came. When I was small, I took care of a water buffalo, which grazed along the waterways and between the paddy fields. There were seven ponds, a patch of sacred forest, in two big camphor trees in front of the village. 
under which many legendary stories about my ancestors were told. The land and water were precious, but the weather would be unpredictable. So we had to design and manage our farm fields wisely, following nature's cycle and wasting nothing and adapting in order to make a living. We worshiped the earth god, water god, and you the great, the legendary king who knew how to manage water and plan the lands. We also worshiped our ancestors who had the wisdom of adapting to nature and cultivating the land. If you take that, those sentences from Professor Yu and you think about them, you realize they offer all of us uh, several important lessons. And in the next slide, I'll, I'll identify some of the lessons at least they offer me. The big lesson is adapt a holistic ecology. Uh, excuse me, adopt a holistic ecology. Choose a holistic ecology. Know that ecology includes the ecologies of the natural world and the ecologies of human life, including the spiritual ecologies the water god. Know that ecology includes what we feel and remember, our ancestors, as well as how we live in the present. Know that an ecological civilization requires attention to all of these ecologies. It must be holistic. And yes, it must include the spiritual as well as the physical. Now here's another quote. He's talking about what happened when he went to the cities and saw them, these urban giants, Beijing, New York City, Chicago, Harbin. The gray infrastructures made of steel and concrete, which we built to connect our physical world are shallow or even fake constructs that are destroying the real and deep connections between human beings and nature and among various natural processes and flows. The alternative is green infrastructure or ecological infrastructure, the construction of which can be inspired by the ancient wisdoms of peasantry. For the past 20 years, I've tried to revive some of these peasantry wisdoms and combine them with modern sciences and technologies to solve some of the most annoying problems in today's urban environment, particularly around water. The, solution, the solutions are simple, inexpensive, and beautiful, and have been applied in a massive and extensive scale in over 200 cities in China and beyond. He'll be telling us about some of those projects, I, I hope. But what do we learn even from this passage? We learn that even if we live in cities, we need to think like a farmer. Indeed, he would say, think like a peasant. He speaks of peasant wisdom from which all can learn. He notes that modern infrastructures are often alienating. They can seem to connect us, but often disconnect us. For truly green cities to emerge, we need to learn from agricultural societies to think like a farmer. And that involves adapting to nature cycles, building communities that are simple, inexpensive, and beautiful. Now, Professor Yu is well known. Uh, by the way, this is one example of, of one of his many, many projects, a well-known example. Um, this is a public space. It, it's called Tange River Park. And forgive me for not remembering exactly the city where it is. But you'll notice that walkway, that red walkway, um, on which people walk as they simultaneously are immersed in the natural world, the more than human world, which serves as a watershed capturing the water and preserving it so that it can do its good work. When I think of ecological civilization, this is one of the images that comes to my mind. And I think the people's relationships to one another are also part of ecological civilization. It's not simply their relationship to the natural world, it's also their relations one to another. Next slide. So here's another quote from Professor Yu. As China becomes more urbanized and civilized, 
this vernacular landscape has gradually been deprived of its productivity, its support to and of life, and its natural beauty. Like the peasant girls whose foot binding crippled them, it has gradually been adapted by the minority urban upper class and transformed into, into artificial decorative gardens. The aesthetic of uselessness, leisure and adornment has taken over as part of a larger over, overwhelming urge to be modern and sophisticated. Stay here for just a second, Andrew. So Professor Yu is known for his critique of a certain notion of beauty where it's sharply separated from the practical, where it's ornamental, is in an ornamental garden that may look pretty to the casual observer, but actually serves no practical function in the life of people. He wants to propose and does propose what he calls Bigfoot beauty. This is different from the beauty of, um, of young peasant girls whose feet were bound. Those whose feet were not bound were called people with big feet. He says, I'm for the big feet. I'm for a kind of beauty that's not elitist that's available to any and all, and that's not separated from practical life. So people ask him, well, are you against the arts? And the next slide, he speaks to that. Next slide. Please don't misunderstand me. In one sense, all art, music and dance is unproductive. It is useless for sustaining biological life. I am not arguing for the end of all of this or for any demeaning of the value of beauty and pleasure in our lives. What I am arguing is that in our resource depleted and ecologically damaged and threatened era, the built environment must and will adapt a new aesthetic grounded in appreciation of the beauty of productive ecology supporting things. Our desire for beauty detached from utility is weakening and it should be. In our new world, survival is at stake wastefulness becomes viscerally unattractive, if not immoral, but there's plenty of opportunity for joyful pleasure in useful things. So next slide, please, Andrew. He encourages us to adopt an ecological aesthetic, to value the ordinary and make peace with the messiness of wild nature. Don't sharply separate utility from beauty. Make things that are useful and beautiful. And finally, there's almost a mystical side in him and his thought. He talks about the difference between the shallow forms in the natural world and the deep forms. Look for the deep forms in things, the forms that emerge from the processes of nature itself. So what I'm trying to say is that we have so much to learn from our awardee tonight and we'll hear more from him. But he issues us awake, some wake-up calls, wonderful wake-up calls. Wake up to, to design the role that designing things plays in human life. Wake up to ecological infrastructures. Wake up to creativity. Wake up to deep and useful beauty. Wake up to farmers and peasant wisdom. Wake up to doing what farmers did at the end of the harvest. They had celebrations, public celebrations. They enjoyed themselves. Wake up to hope. And this is only the beginning when I think about what we in the world of constructive postmodernism, process philosophy, have to learn from Professor Yu tonight. So here we go. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we come now to the presentation of the award. My name is Philip Clayton. I'm president of the Institute for the Postmodern Development of China. Professor Kong Jian Yu is a renowned Chinese ecological urbanist, an urban planner, and one of the world's leading landscape architects. He is the founder and dean of the Graduate School of Landscape Architecture at Peking University. Professor Yu is also the founder of Turinscape, a planning and design firm in China. Professor Yu received his doctoral degree in design from Harvard University Graduate School of Design. For his many achievements, 
He has been named a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. When Professor Yu designs an ecological landscape, he always keeps community in his mind. The red ribbon that he designed is an excellent example. The ribbon is actually a man-made bench which stretches for 500 meters along the riverbank, integrating a boardwalk, lighting, seating, environmental interpretation, and environmental orientation. Various plant specimens are grown in strategically placed holes in the ribbon. Local people can enjoy life and interact there. Yu's ecological approach to urbanism has been implemented in more than 2,000 projects in more than 200 cities in China and abroad. Ladies and gentlemen, we now present the 13th John Cobb Common Good Award to Professor Kongjian Yu. The certificate says, in recognition of his remarkable contribution to human hopes for an ecological civilization, by combining traditional Chinese wisdom with modern science and technology, creating green infrastructures that are earth friendly and functional. They help us reclaim our embeddedness in nature to recover our bonds with one another and to grow toward a more humane, sustainable future. In the spirit of constructive postmodern approach to life that is creative, compassionate, efficient, and beautiful. In recognition of his remarkable achievements, we are delighted to present Professor Kong Jian Yu with a John Cobb Common Good Award. Please join me in applause for Professor Yu. Thank you. Thank you is a great honor. And now, um, Tom, could you say a few words in Chinese about the presentation while I hold up the certificate? Congratulations. We, we go through many candidates and finally Professor Cobb recognized very much about Professor Yu's performance. And this is a very high compliment for individuals. So now I present all the Chinese American and present congratulations to Professor Yu. Wish you have more great achievements for the human community, for the whole world. Congratulations, Professor Yu. Yeah, so now uh, it's your time. Okay. We turn yeah. uh, this to you. This is ours. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jay, Professor Jay McDaniel. So, such a wonderful thorough, deep read of my past works. It's really a great honor, and you make even more clear a uh, definition of what I am. I, I really honored, I, it's wonderful. And uh, thank you, uh, Philip, uh, for such a wonderful comment. Uh, it is a great honor, and uh, uh, Tom, and, and uh, you make uh, such a wonderful Chinese Comments uh, on the award. It is, it is my uh, really great honor. So, 
I find it, yes, I find uh, John and myself, it's really, even we have two generations, almost two generations apart. But in Chinese, we say uh, it's Wang Nian Zi Jiao. I feel we, we are deeply connected, uh, deeply connected. So my speech is just about, it is about art of survival. It is art of survival. So it is honored to be chosen as this year's recipient of COP Common Good Award. I would like to extend my sincere thanks to the Institute for Postmodern Development of China, Center for Process Studies, the members of nomination committee and Professor John Cobb Jr. for his lasting inspirations. As John, I would just quote, said, no problem could be more critical than that of a decent survival of a humanity that threatened to destroy itself by exhausting the polluting, uh, exhausting and polluting its natural context. Flood, drought, habitat loss, pollution, and finally climate change, global wise. Now the industrial civilization is based on the, the great infrastructure to try to build a stronger and increasingly more sophisticated great infrastructure, damming the river, flood wall fighting against the water, channelizing the river to drain away water, more complicated, complicated sewage plant to clean the water. Now, great infrastructure can be necessary to solve urgent individual single-minded problems but it consume huge amount of energy, material, lacks resilience, and often accumulates higher risk of disaster, destroy nature and its resiliency, breaks and connection between man and nature. So the alternative is nature-based ecological civilization or ecological infrastructure that support ecological civilization, which is critical for securing ecosystem services woven together great infrastructure from the protection of nature upstream to the remediation of rural and urban pollution and to the coastal area restoration. So, and for over 20 years, we have tested and built over 500 projects in more than 200 cities and developed several replicable models for healing the land at various scales in China and in the world. While focusing on some major targets, such as flood adaptation, stormwater regulation, water cleansing, climate resiliency, soil remediation. Now these projects are always holistically and systematically designed to provide all kinds of ecosystem, ecosystem services for native species, as, as Jay just mentioned, for people and for the planet as a whole. For, for example, in China, all urban rivers have been dammed and channelized with concrete flood walls, which we call the civilization, by the way. More than 20 billion US dollars invested to control flooding, but a hundred billion get lost each year, continually each year lost due to flood. We have to end this kind of never ending war. So the alternative is ecological thinking. We actually remove such a powerful, strong, looks like a very safe flood wall. It is a Strong, but lifeless, no resiliency at all, and actually very dangerous. So we redesign it and create a terrorist living embankment. Such ecological embankment can reduce peak flow by more than half. So actually we allow water to come into the land and it have more resiliency and the city become more safe. Imagine over 65% of Chinese cities suffer from urban inundation. 
and almost all of cities in the developing countries in the monsoon climate are suffering urban inundation. Now, is that mean we have to build a stronger, more thicker pipes or more powerful pumps to use more electricity to pump out flood? Not necessary. We need an alternative, terracing the ground, pounding the, the swamp, and islanding the lake. Now that can create a nature-based sponge that not only solves the problem of urban inundation and created a park for the people, for the community, and a habitat for native biodiversities, and also produce, I mean, also increase the property value. So in this case, you can see ecology can be economy, the same things. Ecology provide all kinds of services that we, we don't really recognize its value yet so far. That's why ecology and economy is the same thing. Imagine 75% of surface water is contaminated in China and 85% of sewage global-wise, globally, goes to the rivers and seas untreated. We need alternative and affordable and fast solutions for this kind of industrial byproducts. Now nature can work. So the constructed wetland can remove nutrient from the biological, uh, through the biological process, not only produce clean water, but produce a productive and beautiful global surface. This is Huang Pujang in Shanghai. We design a living landscape on a former brownfield to treat the polluted river water to, to recover the degraded waterfront and aesthetically beautiful. Now that's a very simple terracing farming technique. Lush vegetation, clean up the soil, a uh, clean up the soil and the water. 85% of nutrients can be removed by this process. Every day, this parks three hectares of concentrated wetland filters phosphorus and nitrogens from 2,400 cubic meter of water. Now this can be a more effective solution for larger scale water issues. Imagine the Bohai Sea, more than 700,000 square kilometers in size, seriously contaminated, polluted, and become a dead sea. So in a pilot project in Qinghuangdao city, we create a green sponge along this coastal shoreline to catch, to stop the chemicals from running into the sea. And it performs extremely well. Now, climate change, of course, means higher risk of storm. But does that mean we have to build a higher and stronger concrete wall? Not necessary. We may make nature to work, the mangroves. But as a key challenge is it's to find an efficient and inexpensive method to establish the mangroves that had been destroyed by our industrial and urbanization process. Now, in this case, in Sanya City in China's Hainan Island, urban construction debris and concrete from the demolition of the flood wall was recycled on site and an interlocking finger design was used to lead, to lead ocean tide into the waterways to create ideal habitat for mangroves to speed up the process of natural evolution. So in just three years, we recover the brown field within the flood wall be turned into a green lush urban park. Now imagine 60% of urban soil is contaminated because of urban development and industrial uh, uh, industrialization in China. Conventional remediation is usually very expensive. In Tianjin, for example, in this case, alkaline soil, brownfield, heavily contaminated, we use nature. We collect stormwater, use assiduous stormwater to dissolve the urban uh, uh, pollutants 
and then and start as a evolution of natural process of native communities. And at the same time, create a beautiful park for the community, for the people. Now we are not just talking about a piece of park. We are talking about transformation of the whole infrastructure from gray into green. This is an example in Mesa River in Haiko. Flood, at the same time drought, now people keep building industrial infrastructure, higher and higher flood wall, dredging the water, the riverbed, but never get a success. For 20 years, the problem is still there. So go back to the ecological civilization sinking, remove the concrete, tarries in the ground, catch the stonewater runoff, create a park for the people. So nature is a holistic services. Yeah, so in just a couple of years, the whole drainage infrastructure get transformed and the city get transformed. Habitat is covered in dense city center, birds come back, fish come back. Similarly, huh? okay. Similarly, in Russia, the polluted and the concrete waterfront has been healed and revitalized through nature-based solution. Okay. So it looks like you didn't see the PowerPoint. Is that right? Yes. Uh, oh, but, uh, but uh, PPT may not do. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry, is, is that right? Can you see? Uh, yeah. Yes. So I, I, I'm sorry. So you, you didn't see the PowerPoint. But anyway, I think it's a language if maybe fine. So and, and uh, so that's the high code project. You can see the transformation of the whole gray infrastructure into green infrastructure, which is a support for what we call a new lifestyle, a new civilization in the city, in China, is the Mesa River. So we cover the habitat, the birds come back, fish come back. And similarly in Russia, the polluted and concrete waterfront has been healed and revitalized through nature-based solutions. In just a couple of years, you can see people, you can see birds and fish come together in a former lifeless waterfront. In the past 50 years, China has built over 60 billion square meters of building, but 99% of them are energy inefficient consuming about 50% of total energy. Now, nature-based solution may help to solve this problem. See here, we propose a vertical urban farm for the CCTV tower. Now certainly that's a joke, but uh, in my own home, I collect stone water and energy from the roof and the grow vegetable on the balcony I produce 32 kilograms of vegetables each year. I collect 50 tons of rainwater from the roof, from the balcony, and recycle the water to create a living wall to air condition the home, save 2,000 kilowatt of electricity. Now, this helps show the community that everyone, every individual, can contribute to healing the planet by practicing simple nature-based solution at home. So more than ever, we have to listen to the way we build our cities and the way we treated water and even the way we define civilization. Ecological civilization means we have to evaluate all what we have achieved under the label of industrial civilization and it remains suspicious of the current road toward the destination and make a detour and explore a new way, the nature-based way. This is an art of survival to solve the problem we have facing today. Thank you. Again, it is a great honor for me to have such a beautiful award. Thank you. 
And next, we would like to invite um, uh, Dr. Cobb to comment. Um, he's taken a leadership role in bringing process thought uh, to the East and most specifically has helped China develop more ecological civilization um, with Jihe Wang and um, Beijun Fan. Uh, Cobb has um, founded the uh, Institute for Postmodern Development in China in uh, 2005 and substantially assisted the development of over 30 centers of uh, process collaboration um, in uh, China. Um, it's a remarkable um, uh, synergy between uh, Dr. Cobb and, and China. Um, it's, he's written over 50 books, uh, has um, starting with a major impact on in 1971, is it too late? The Theology of Ecology. And uh, he co authored in 1989 uh, a book for the common good, redirecting the economy towards community, environment, and a sustainable future. Um, Dr. Cobb. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, before I read the few pages that I have here, I would like to say. I am profoundly encouraged. We have here a man who not only thinks the right way and acts remarkably, but who is accepted by his people, apparently. I mean, the number of things that he is able to do, it's simply astonishing. If it can be done in China, it, I wish I could say then it could be done in the United States. I'm not sure that that's true. But uh, I, I hope that you are all rejoicing, I'm, I am, that there is in the world a man who has made the enormous actual changes that he has made and that he has looked to by his people for more. We have been honored by the opportunity to honor a deep thinker who acts on his insights and wisdom on critical issues. His work shows that China's leadership on the global scene is not limited to economy. In the field of thought, China is offering us visions of a truly postmodern civilization, one that thoughtfully integrates a great and ancient culture with the best of modern science and a passion to heal the wounds that modernity has caused. Not many years ago, many people around the world admired the United States and copied us. I personally was very proud of my country. I was in the army of occupation in Japan and I thought it unlikely that any other occupation in history had been as peaceful and beneficial to the defeated people as that one. Many of the people who looked up to the United States were in China. Students came to our universities from China. American professors visiting in China could count on invitations to speak in Chinese universities. Chinese wanted to be recognized and approved by Americans. We had a great opportunity to work together with Chinese students and friends. I am addressing primarily Americans who have long assumed that we are the flagship of the future. Such a self-understanding has always had ambiguous consequences, but it becomes clear that ours are not the best policies, the best science, the best forms of government, the best economy or the best education. The positive consequences of this self-understanding have faded and what is left has become a desperate effort to hold on to wealth by exercising military power. It seems that we do not want partners with whom to share the work of bringing peace and justice to the world. We want other nations to serve us. If they affirm their own interests, we seek regime change, sanction them to make life harder for the poor. 
use our drones to kill individual opponents, and sometimes go to war with them. In relation to China, I'm glad to say that none of our imperial efforts will work. Out of fear or greed, many leaders around the world still serve us. But around the world, more and more people are looking to China for leadership. From China, they hope for real help. We are losing. Our press keeps knowledge of these changes in our global standing from us. They have succeeded in getting the public to accept ignorance about what happens beyond our borders. Foreign policy plays no role in selecting a president. Even so, a bit of reality seeps through. Our rulers have not succeeded in hiding from us our role in starving and killing the people of Yemen. We are getting inklings of our support of apartheid, perhaps even genocide in Israel. Some realize that our role in Syria has ended up as simple theft of oil fields. More our learning of our prevention of indigenous, more of us are learning of our prevention of indigenous majorities to rule Latin American countries. Our policy has often been to support terrorist movements that weaken governments that are not subservient to us. When governments respond by the oppression of those that we have stimulated to act against them, the controlled press lets the world know their violation of human rights. This tactic most recently is being used against China with radical elements among the Uyghurs. But in the overall picture, the worst that the CIA can do against China is an irritant. Our dirty tricks postpone, maybe even prevent the close cooperation the world so urgently needs from its two greatest powers. Their cooperation moving the world toward an ecological civilization could save hundreds of millions of lives. We seem to prefer to work unilaterally in improving our ability to kill. I describe with great pain the depths of the hole we are digging for ourselves. I hope this will underscore the importance of my main point. Let us not leave to our government our relations with the Chinese people. Let us recognize and appreciate their wisdom, their generosity, and their vision, and celebrate how it leads them to act. While our government declares them to be our number one enemy, let us extend the hand of friendship. And let us be grateful that their government has not responded to our declaration of enmity by using similar language. I believe that the United States will eventually abandon its failed goal of unilateral domination of the world. It will shift its spending from weapons to kill others to helping the poor and disadvantaged in our own country. Most of us will rejoice and some of us will be prepared to build a new world on friendship and cooperation. We will count on the forgiveness of people like tonight's honoree and be ready to learn from him. He and other Chinese have much to teach us. May that time come soon. Dr. Cobb, could you go back to the podium? We'd like a, an opportunity for a quick photo. Wonderful. So if you can stand at the podium right in the middle there and then look look forward to the camera, not to the screen. To the camera, okay. Yep, there we go. Okay. All right. And E, O, oh, S. So. Okay. That's it. Okay. Very good.
So uh, thank you, Dr. Cobb. Yeah, congratulations uh, for Professor Yi. Yeah. So now it's our uh, closing uh, uh, performance uh, needed by uh, Jim McDaniel. So we already uh, knew uh, Professor Jim McDaniel very well. Uh, Besides uh, many uh, talent uh, he has, yeah, he is a thinker, philosopher, and uh, he is also a musician. Yeah. So now let's welcome Jim McDaniels and his uh, Arkansas group. Yeah, all right. Uh, thanks to everybody. And one of, let me say a word, Andrew, real quick, okay? Yeah. So when I go to China, I like to sing with people and uh, I love to learn Chinese songs and I've learned some. Um, but tonight we'll sing a, a, an American song that many Chinese know. It's called Country Roads. And we chose this song, Country Roads, because it reminds us of Professor Yu's work, where he brings the role of, of, of farmers and an agricultural past into the present. He takes us home on country roads to where we come from so that we can move forward in a deep way that welcomes science, welcomes technology, but also welcomes, in his words, peasant wisdom as our way into the future. That's, that's a hope for Chinese. That's a hope for everybody in the world. So this is my band. It's a recording of my band singing Country Roads. It's not live. And we sang it at, a, at another performance. And so they didn't smile enough for my purposes. They're a little, little too somber. But we dedicate this to you, to everyone tonight. Or in every, everyone today, Country Roads, by my band. Here we go. Almost heaven, West Virginia, Blue Ridge Mountains, Shenandoah River. Life is all there. Older than the trees, younger than the mountains, growing like a breeze. Country road, take me home to the place I belong. West Virginia, mountain mama, take me home. Country road. All my memories gather around her. Miner's lady, stranger to blue water. Dark and dusty, painted on the sky. Misty taste of moonshine, teardrops in my eye. Country road, take me home to the place. I'm in old West Virginia, mountain mama, take me home, country road. Virginia, West Virginia, 
mountain on a mountain on. Take me home, country road. Oh, take me home, country road. Oh, take me home, down country road. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Tia, and the thanks to your team. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. So, uh, take us home. Uh, need uh, by Dr. Cobb and the, the eco pioneers. So tonight mm. it's a wonderful light. We really enjoy this. We congratulations, uh, Professor Yu uh, Kong Jian. And uh, thank you for uh, joining us for this uh, historic event. And uh, wish you all of you well. And uh, have a nice evening and have a nice weekend. Bye bye.